Well, welcome to this uh, meeting of the Justice Select Committee. Um, welcome to our various uh, witnesses who will come to in a moment. Uh, but uh, as with um, all meetings of the committee, we have to start with a declaration of members of interest. Members of interests, uh, I'm a non-practicing barrister and consultant to a law firm, uh, Ms. Eagle. I am a uh, non-practicing solicitor chair. Thank you. Mr. Daly. I am a practicing solicitor and partner in a firm of uh, solicitors. And Paul, uh, Mr. Paul Barker, nothing, no relevant. Nothing. Thank I think. you. Hey, thank you. Okay. And then I think um, looks as if um, Kieran, Dr. Mullen and Mr. Slaughter have just joined us. No relevant interest, I think, Dr. Mullen. No, no, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Slaughter, you have. I think Mr. Slaughter appears to be there somewhere. I'm here, Chair. Uh, and you're, 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 you're a non-practicing barrister, aren't you? Just I am, yes. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Thanks very much. Um, and then we'll add other people in as we, uh, as, as we go along. Well, the purpose of this meeting is to take evidence in relation to uh, private prosecutions. And uh, it's triggered by um, the cases involving the post office and private prosecutions, which have uh, had some publicity, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but uh, we are not going to go into the detail of those cases uh, because the sub judice rule, uh, which applies in Parliament as much as anywhere else is engaged, you know, certain cases have been uh, referred for appeal, but not yet determined. So we, have, we can't discuss the detail of any of uh, those cases. We can talk about general principles, uh, civil litigation, which has been concluded, which I know is the case in relation uh, to the post office, is not covered by the uh, sub judice rule as it happens. So I hope that makes the ground rules uh, clear for everybody, both members uh, and uh, witnesses. Um, perhaps I can just start with our first panel of uh, witnesses uh, and uh, ask if we may, Mr. Warmington and Mr. Henderson, to just introduce themselves. Hey, Thank you, Sir Bob. Uh, Ron Warmington, uh, Chartered Accountant, uh, specialised for years in uh, fraud investigation, mainly in big companies. And uh, we, of course, Ian and I headed up the investigation into the post office, which uh, we'll just keep in the background. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, Mr. Henderson. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Ian Henderson, Chartered Accountant, IT Auditor and Director of Second Sight. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, uh, can I start? It does relate to the post office, but within those parameters. So yep. without going into the detail of particular cases, what I would be interested in is this. You were brought in to do an investigation yourselves to examine the way in which um, uh, these private prosecutions uh, were uh, conducted. And what I'd be grateful for is uh, some information as to what your firm's investigation revealed about the way in which the post office investigated and prosecuted alleged criminal offences. I, I know that they now no longer have prosecute offences themselves, as I understand it, unless I'm wrong. Um, but what was the system, basically, that we're interested in? Chairman, thank you. If I can start just with some context, perhaps. Yes. Uh, post office inherited procedures from the Royal Mail Group prior to their split in April 2012. We're not aware of any review of those protocols within post office who continued the previous policy of using private prosecutions to facilitate debt recovery. The priority was, was very clearly the recovery of losses. Private prosecutions were seen as a quick, cost-effective way of achieving that, either through proceeds of crime legislation uh, or by putting pressure on defendants to make good the alleged losses. Defendants were routinely threatened with the charge of theft, which would not be proceeded with, providing they pleaded guilty to false accounting, made good all losses, and didn't mention any problems with Horizon. The investigations were usually extremely limited. Problems with Horizon were effectively off limits to investigators, who as a matter of policy were not allowed to consider Horizon as the cause of the reported shortfalls. The priority was finding evidence to support the prosecution case to the exclusion of all other possibilities. Both investigators and prosecutors routinely ignored their duty 
to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. Furthermore, disclosure was often inadequate. Documents under the control of post office that were relevant to the alleged offences were sometimes not obtained due to the cost of doing so. Once the sub postmaster was suspended, they were not allowed access to their records and were prevented from conducting their own investigations. We were so concerned about these issues that we found uh, that we told post office that there was evidence of possible misconduct by prosecutors and miscarriages of justice. We reported those concerns to the Business Innovation and Skills Committee in 2015 in an evidence session. Those concerns sadly were ignored. We said that post office was demonstrated institutional blindness and was refusing to consider evidence of problems with Horizon. We now know that a decision was made by a subcommittee of the board of post office to withhold evidence from us that would have dealt with these issues. To sum up, there was not a single point of failure. Investigators failed to conduct thorough impartial investigations. Prosecutors failed to exercise their legal and professional obligations. Senior management failed to understand the legal and technology risks they were facing. Post office demonstrated institutional blindness. It was a perfect storm that existed for many years. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, were you able to ascertain what the oversight was of those investigations and decisions to prosecute? To whom were they referred, for example? Who had the ultimate charging decision? The, the short answer was that there was very little oversight. But Paula, Lettle, uh, Paula Venels, the former CEO, has recently written to the Bayes Committee and makes it very clear that functions such as legal investigations operated in self-contained silos. There was little or no oversight of those functions. It was always somebody else's responsibility. There was no independent review of individual prosecutions uh, or indeed investigations. We are not aware of any private prosecutions by the Royal Mail Group or Post Office ever being taken over by the Crown Prosecution Service, as it would have been entitled to do so, or any applications for it to do so. We were told by Post Office that an external law firm had reviewed some of the prosecutions being considered by the Mediation Working Group in 2013 and that no problems were identified. The validity of that advice is now highly questionable. The chairman of the Mediation Working Group and a former Law Justice of Appeal, Sir Anthony Hooper, reviewed seven pending prosecutions by Post Office in 2014. None of those cases were proceeded with. With the exception of four private prosecutions in 2015, Post Office stopped using <clears throat> private prosecutions at about that time. Previously, approximately 50 private prosecutions were brought every year between 2000 and 2012. That's helpful. Do that, I take it they now refer uh, allegations of this kind to the, to the Crown Prosecution Service to at least carry out investigations? The short answer is I, I don't know. I mean, we have not had any recent contact with, with Post Office. We just know in, in a statement that they have made that they are no longer using private prosecutions. That's, that's, that's about what we know too. Yeah. Um, just specifically on that, um, you talked about disclosure. Um, were, for, were there, for example, as far as you could ascertain, proper disclosure schedules um, prepared in the way that you would normally expect in, in cases of this kind? Uh, in some cases, that there were limited schedules produced, but the, the, the real problem was the fact that I investigations were so inadequate. Um, and um, uh, material that was not found in the course of the investigation clearly wasn't um, entered on the schedule and, and wasn't considered by the prosecutor. Yeah, OK. And, and the, the acceptance of a plea to false accounting isn't of itself unusual. Um, I think you'd agree in cases uh, of this kind, if um, the prosecution, be it the Crown Prosecution Service, however, think that the sentencing powers of the court will be adequate to meet the gravamen of the offence. So that in itself isn't unusual. Um, what was, was there anything unusual about the way it was used in this case? I, I think what was unusual was, was the, the combination of multiple charges, one of which typically would be theft, um, mm. which usually was, was felt to, to would probably lead to a custodial sentence. And, and of course, yeah. it was the fear of that that drove many of the decisions by defendants.
Okay, understood. Mr. Stoughton wants to come in briefly, then I'll move to Ms. Eagle. Very briefly, it was just something that you said, Mr. Henderson, about when you spoke to the, the, the chief executive. Um, I think from the answer you've given, we can see that these are extraordinary, extraordinary way to conduct any prosecutorial, prosecutorial process in this country. Who was who made the decisions that allowed it to happen? Are you saying that the uh, you're saying that the senior management didn't know what was going on? Are you therefore saying that the decisions of how to conduct these prosecutions were taken lower down, or that it was just a culture and it just happened in that way? It was largely just a culture. That there was a, a head of group legal, uh, and under the, the head of group legal, there was a senior prosecutor. Uh, we met with uh, a number of in-house prosecutors um, and formed the, the view that they operated pretty much sort of independently. Uh, I don't know to what extent um, there was internal review of their work. There, there certainly didn't appear to be any. Okay, thanks very much. Maria Eagle. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, you've just set out there, Mr. Henderson, an extremely um, sobering and serious set of uh, concerns uh, in respect of what you found when you had a look at the post office's way of doing things. Um, not talking about that, but in your experience doing this kind of work, what, what steps should an organisation take in order to ensure that it conducts uh, an objective investigation into alleged crimes when it is itself also the victim, which was the case with the post office? Thank you very much. Um, in short, having the right people doing the right thing. Uh, there must be an element of independent oversight of the of the work performed. Independence, of course, is as much a state of mind um, as anything and can be exercised on an internal basis within a large uh, organisation. But uh, as I've said, having the right people doing the, the right thing is absolutely vital. There should also be clear terms of reference, policies and procedures governing both investigations and prosecutions. And if investigations are being conducted internally, individual cases should be a ca subject to occasional independent scrutiny and audit. Um, investigators should be professionally qualified and subject to a, a code of conduct. Do, do you think um, that where cases aren't being investigated and prosecuted independently, uh, that the alleged offenders ought to be informed of that fact. Yes, I mean a detailed reading of of the of the case papers should make that clear. Um, but I also think that consideration should be given to to certification by a responsible named person that all reasonable lines of inquiry have been pursued. I mean, that's what strikes us now as as being a, a significant sort of oversight in everything that we found. It may also be appropriate that all decisions to prosecute are signed off by the head of legal or an appropriate member of the board. After all, prosecutions are being brought in effect on behalf of the organisation. Indeed, I wonder to what extent, um, I mean, there's no, there doesn't seem to have been any oversight on the basis of what you've said. Um, I wonder to what extent legal or regulatory safeguards uh, might limit the ability of an organization to use the right to bring a, a private prosecution and do you think that there's a, a scope there to make sure that um, this this potential conflict of interest between being a victim and being the prosecutor um, of an offense might be mitigated well, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that we should ban all private sort of prosecutions in, in the austere environment and times that we now find ourselves. I, I can see them being a, a useful function for, for all sorts of reasons. But there needs to be greater safeguards to meet the, the, the to make sure that the obligation to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry have, has actually uh, been met. The right to bring a private prosecution could be removed in, in, in circumstances where there is no element of independent review or investigation. That does not necessarily mean moving the entire investigation or prosecution outside of the organisation, but perhaps introducing some uh, element of, of independent oversight of, of that, those internal actions. And finally, that the right to conduct private prosecutions could be subject to occasional spot checks by an external body, such as the CPS, which I think is available under current legislation. 
Do you think um, legal safeguards or regulatory safeguards are the best way of going about um, creating such a, a, a fail safe? I, I think probably both. I, I mean, the, the 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 function has got to be um, available through the the law. Um, but what has been conspicuous by its absence throughout every case that we looked at was any exercise of regulatory uh, oversight um, of the the relevant sort of professionals. And, and I think that is a separate issue that uh, perhaps needs to be covered. Thank you very much. I have a question for for Mr. Warmington. I think. Um, have you encountered potential misuse of investigations and prosecutions in other organisations? We've just referred to the work that you did about uh, the way the post office was conducting itself. Uh, but have you encountered this kind of potential misuse of investigations and prosecutions in other organisations? Uh, well, certainly the misuse of investigations. I mean, uh, firstly, organisations often uh, conduct and, and rightly should um, occasionally limited scope investigations. And sometimes there are good reasons for, for limiting scope in, in that way. Uh, more worryingly, uh, organisations also conduct limited scope or limited investigations based on assumptions that could be flawed or, or simply have been untested. The obvious suspect in the case is not necessarily the perpetrator of the crime, particularly in um, evidentially complex cases. A, a package of evidence, therefore, prepared on a, on a false premise or on the results of a flawed investigation can't be remedied at the prosecution stage unless the prosecutor is alert to the possibility that key lines of inquiry have not been pursued and then is prepared to challenge the investigator on that point. And that can be difficult to do in practice uh, and, and demonstrates why a strong, independently minded and professionally qualified investigation team is an essential component in any organisation considering uh, using private prosecutions. And all too often, we must be aware that the test applied by the prosecutor is solely one of sufficiency. In other words, does the evidence produced by the investigation team uh, provide a realistic prospect of conviction? And the prosecutor also needs to question as a preliminary issue whether or not all reasonable lines of inquiry have been pursued. And, and if he or she is not satisfied that that's been done, the risk of a miscarriage of justice is significantly increased. Um, now we know we all know that investigations supporting private prosecutions in a sense th therefore require special care pressure on police resources obviously means that increasingly in-house investigation company investigators uh, are conducting investigations that in the past would have been carried out by the police and no longer can be obviously we're all aware of cases involving private investigations where the CPS has decided not to prosecute and that puts the victim in a difficult position because a successful criminal prosecution has to be often seen as the first step in the recovery of losses. And that can lead to a, a private prosecutions being undertaken either using in-house legal resources or by referral to one of the specialist law firms who offer private prosecutions as a service, sometimes with their own investigative team as part of the arrangement. So private prosecutions are being widely promoted these days by law firms as a cost-effective alternative to civil debt recovery, and that's fine. But even the most skilled and ethically sound prosecutor can't disclose what hasn't been discovered by the investigators. In other words, if you'll forgive me for the, uh, using the vernacular, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So that's all I have to say. In other words, at the end of the day, Absent a really effective, thorough, competent, um, uh, ethically uh, sound, open-minded investigation, uh, the prosecutor is in a rather difficult situation, and therefore so is the defendant. Well, thank you, Mr. Warmington. You haven't said you, you said that there's potential for misuse yeah. uh, in the nature of the beast, but yeah. you haven't said that you've encountered it in any other organisations. Just can I press you on that point as my final question? You most certainly can. Yeah, I mean, I, my experience as an investigator covered 100 countries, uh, generally for American organisations. But American organisations are unfamiliar with using private prosecutions. They're, they're not allowed in many states. Um, my debt recovery experience uh, was 
almost always uh, effected through civil claims. I, I personally have never initiated or instigated um, a private prosecution. And that's why, in a sense, what Mr. Henderson and I came across in, um, in post office was so uh, weird and, 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 and shocking to us. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to uh, answer your question more effectively from personal experience. No, that, that's fine. Thank you very much, Chair. What I, what I would add is that um, a corporate investigator has enormous power, and, and if, they, if, they, if they follow a, a, a trail of breadcrumbs to a, a, the wrong person who has been set up by the real crook, um, it's, it's, almost, it's ever so easy for the, the innocent person to be fired, their, their whole career to be trashed, only for the company two years later to suffer an identical fraud and realise that they've nailed the wrong person. Understood. That's helpful. Uh, Mr. Daly. Um, yes, uh, I, I just wanted to ask a, a question. I, I worked in the criminal court for many years and I just wanted to understand the, the process as I experienced it with these matters. In that the in house legal department would uh, authorise charge and provide the statements and other undisclosed evidence and various other bits of evidence to an agent prosecutor who would then prosecute the matter in the criminal courts on behalf of the post office. Um, and they, they when, if there were any legal issues, obviously if the prosecutor doesn't know about those, I fully accept that point. But if the defence solicitor had issues, they would write to the agent prosecutor who would then write to the legal department in the post office who would investigate and produce further evidence. Now, is that, is my recollection of how these matters were prosecuted incorrect or is that what happened? If, if I may answer that, uh, I, I was in the fortunate position in, in the early stages of our investigation to be given access to the, the legal files within the post office, met with uh, their, their senior prosecutor and a number of their other lawyers. Uh, the process that you've described, broadly speaking, was followed uh, for the, 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 the simple practical reason that prosecutions were occurring all over the country. Post office head office was based in London. And as a matter of sheer practicality, instructions would normally be given to a, a criminal team um, in the, the relevant jurisdiction, you know, which could be in the north of England or, 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 or wherever. Um, there was, however, sort of close contact between um, the, the senior prosecutor within sort of post office who, who did provide support. Um, my experience was that there was very little challenge to the evidential package that was prepared by sort of post office, um, possibly for the reasons that we've outlined, a, a wholly inadequate prosecu uh, prosecution package and investigation, and possibly because of post office's policy uh, of offering, uh, in, in, in very many cases, this plea bargain you know, we, we will drop or we will not pursue a charge of theft if you put your hands up to false accounting. False accounting is a very easy charge to prove. Um, and I, I felt on many occasions that defendants were being bullied into accepting that what was perceived as a lesser charge and thereby avoid a custodial sentence. In practice, that's what sub postmasters were frightened of. And I think the, the defense in many cases was possibly not as effective as it could be because they uh, were bullied into accepting um, a, a, a plea. I just want, Chair, just one more question. I just want to understand when you say bullying, who's doing the bullying? Are you saying it's the, 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 the post office or is it the lawyer who's the agent lawyer in court? Because I never personally experienced this bullying when I was involved in these cases. So. Well, I, I, I'm referring to that because that's how it's been described to us as uh, by victims uh, in the sense of, of defendants. They felt that they were being bullied by post office into accepting what they felt was a lesser charge and would be less likely to attract a custodial sentence. Okay. Thank you, Chet. That's, uh, I understand. That's, that, 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 that's helpful. Um, and when, when, when most of these cases resolved in the magistrate's court by the sound of it than uh, the, perhaps the majority um however some um did 
did move on to the the, the higher courts, uh, depending on the se severity of the offences and the range of offences that were, were being uh, that were on the charge sheet. Um, we, we typically saw a very large number of, of charges being considered, um, and um, you know some charges were left to lie on on file, uh, particularly if if a guilty plea was eventually offered. Yeah, again, again, that of itself not unusual. But um, when it went to the Crown Court, I assume, picking up on Mr. Daly's point, the agent prosecutor would have instructed normally counsel or perhaps their own in-house high court advocate. Uh, to do yes, um, we are aware that counsel was instructed in, in some cases, but by all means, you know, not necessarily all. OK, I, I understood. And the final thing I was going to interested in, we talked about the disclosure failures and the failure, as Mr. Warmington said, to pursue all relevant lines of evidence. Mm. Um, you know, when we talk to the Crown Prosecution Service, they would think in terms of applying the full code test, uh, as they put it, both to charging decisions and, and also to disclosure. Yeah. What do you think that was being done in, in these cases? Well, it didn't look... Well, of course, the, the, the preliminary stage prior to considering the full c code test was to consider uh, the adequacy of the investigation. And a prosecutor could only apply the full code test based on the material that is made available to him or her. So um, that was the that was the major failing that, that we sort of came across. Um, the, the prosecutor, whoever they, they were, was being denied the full facts due to th this in, inadequate evidence and uh, an investigation. Yep. Ian, it's probably worth mentioning that there was um, what we saw um, and, and as later, uh, later has, uh, has been proved to be the case, there was this uh, quite inappropriate reliance on the system having unquestionable integrity. It, it, it was so good and so reliable, uh, operated in so many uh, places without problem, that it couldn't possibly be responsible for any of the aberrations that we encountered. Um, the investigators seem to have taken that on board and, and we found no evidence um, of any capability uh, or readiness to challenge uh, the system, or for that matter, any back office processes, in any way whatsoever. Okay. Well, I think I've also mentioned that the um, that the conditional plea that was that was usually offered was conditional upon no challenge being made as to the um, effectiveness of the Horizon system. Um, and uh, and by doing that, post office effectively removed Horizon from being properly considered by by the courts um, during the prosecution. So they were sort of dictating the factual basis of the plea. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. They would not accept a plea if the defendant raised Horizon as an issue. Oh, I see. That's um, um, Dr. Mullen, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ian, I think you mentioned that no one. Uh, made use of their right to refer these cases to the CPS for their own take on whether or not to continue. Is, would I be right in that you said that? And if, if that was the case, why do you think that was? Why do you think nobody did undertake what many witnesses have told us is a key safeguard? Well, th that is certainly my understanding. And, and based on all the files that I looked at, I never saw any reference yeah. to a referral to the, the CPS. Um, clearly, individual defendants may well not have been aware of, of, of that right or, or, or that opportunity. Um, as to why they didn't exercise that, a number of factors may have been relevant. Firstly, these prosecutions typically took many months, if not years, to get to, to court. Um, postmasters were suspended. Um, they were prevented from um, uh, sort of earning any, any money from their, their business. Uh, they were refused access to their business records. They, they were in a desperate sort of position. Um, and that the only relief or the only prospect of relief that they had was getting the case dealt with as quickly as possible. Once they realized the possibility of a plea bargain and, and what they no doubt perceived as a reduced uh, sentence or threat of a, a non-custodial sentence, that became very attractive sort of to them. So frankly, they probably weren't looking at the most effective defense. They were looking, what is the best deal that they can get in the circumstances? Okay. Ron, I don't know if you had any, anything to add to that. Happy with that, no. Mr. Okay. Um, the final thing I was going to ask, um, 
unless any other colleagues have any questions for this panel. Um, uh, gentlemen, is this, um, we know when we did a, a, an inquiry last year, it was uh, into disclosure more generally, um, that the College of Policing, for example, has uh, undertaken a lot of work to make sure that investigate the police officers carrying out investigations are aware of their responsibilities um, in pursuing all relevant lines of inquiry and thereafter of disclosure. As far as you could ascertain, uh, had any of the post office investigators been given any training as to what those responsibilities were and how to carry them out? We, we didn't look into this in, in detail, but based on the case papers that we saw, uh, a number of things struck us. Firstly, none of the investigators that we came across were professionally qualified. Um, they might have had a great deal of experience, you know, working within sort of post office, yeah. knew the procedures, um, you know, in considerable sort of detail. But in terms of professional sort of training, we saw no evidence of, of that at all. Um, therefore, I think it's highly likely that they were not aware of best practice in, in terms of um, uh, criminal procedure I I evidence and so on. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Does any colleagues have any more questions? Um, for uh, Mr. Warmington uh, and uh, Mr. Henderson. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your evidence. We also considered your written evidence, of course, as well, which has also been most helpful to us. So we're extremely grateful to you for your time uh, and trouble in giving evidence to us this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and we'll move now then to the, the second panel, if we may. We'll get our technical team to organize that for us. Right. Have we got all our witnesses here for the, the second panel? Ms. Levitt, Mr. Minty, and Mr. Patel. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll, least, I'll ask you just to introduce yourselves. Uh, Ms. Levitt, I want to say that, of course, we're old friends and colleagues from practice at the bar. It's nice, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Sir Bob. Um, I am Alison Levitt. I am Queen's Counsel in self-employed practice. I am a member of the Committee of the Private Prosecutors Association, but I am also a former Principal Legal Advisor to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr Minty. Good afternoon. Gareth Minty. I am a Legal Director at the Law Firm of Shkon Derea. Uh, like Alison, also a committee member with the Private Prosecutors Association. I am an employed barrister uh, and also, like Alison, a former life, uh, my former role was at the Crown Prosecution Service before I joined private practice. Thanks very much. <laughs> Mr Patel. Thank you. Uh, I'm partner at Alliant Law. Uh, I'm also a practicing barrister and have been for about 30 years. And for about the last 10 years, I've been involved in a number of private prosecutions as capacities counsel. Thank Thanks very much. Um, I think perhaps we, if we could just start, um, for those witnesses who don't have a legal background, or, or for those people who are, who are going to read our inquiry, hopefully, you may not have a legal background, um, a lot of people probably won't understand the difference between uh, a private prosecution and what they might perceive as a public prosecution, one undertaken by, let's say, the Crown Prosecution Service or one of the other um, state agencies uh, with the power to do so. Could somebody encapsulate that perhaps for us, what, what one of the, the differences both of uh, nature and, and process? Um. Are you happy for me to go ahead? The, in essence, in practice, there are far more similarities than there are differences. Once the case starts, it runs through the criminal courts in exactly the same way as a public prosecution would, including in terms of sentence at the conclusion of it, exactly the same sentences being available as there would be for a public prosecution. One of the major differences is obviously in terms of how it starts off. And a second major difference is that I think in our view, we would say that private prosecutions are probably, at least these days, subject to greater scrutiny by the courts even than public prosecutions are. That is to say that the courts are aware that there may be things that they want to take a particular look at, for example, disclosure or the way that things have been handled. Is that because the court may have some concerns about the adequacy of the internal procedures? We've heard evidence. I know that one of the things that you um, may ask us later on is about the tension that exists where somebody is the victim but also the prosecutor. That that tension obviously doesn't exist in public prosecution. There may be different problems with public prosecutions, but that tension isn't there. But all courts will be aware of the fact that this has not been through the processes of the public investigation and public yeah. prosecution, and therefore it, it needs to be 
be watched and be the court will be looking for reassurance that things have been done properly. Yeah. Okay. So any other, other witnesses, Mr. Minty, Mr. Patel, any other observations? Uh, you were, sorry, you Mr. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gareth. If I may, uh, the, in my experience, the root problem, and it's already been touched on, is that uh, the various participants wear different hats. In mm. the public prosecution, the victim is a witness and no more, has no say in the investigation, has no say in the prosecution, does not control the things. Uh, the investigation is invariably carried out by the police independently and the prosecution by the Crown Prosecution Service independent of the police and of the victim. In a private prosecution, as we know, the victim is invariably the private prosecutor. And in my experience, that is causes real problems because of the wearing of multiple different hats. Uh, as to further distinctions, the level of scrutiny in public prosecutions is greater than in a private prosecution. Alison has obviously touched upon the court and the courts can only play the role they can play by being given disclosure of all material. But in my experience, a, a court is unlikely to want to know the minutiae of how an investigation started, progressed uh, and culminated in a charging decision because the courts, in my experience, are necessarily concerned with that. Uh, if it's a public prosecution, they have the reassurance in any, in any event inbuilt into the system. Uh, and so I think that real problem, uh, which I've encountered as a prosecutor, uh, uh, prosecuting private prosecutions, and I think we'll touch on something later on, which is uh, privilege, because yeah. privilege uh, in, in public prosecutions are very, very different. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, those are some of the differences and also I could just add that um, public bodies are, are subject to scrutiny by the High Court in the form of judicial review, yep. their decisions and so forth. Private bodies are not. Yeah, uh, understood. Mr Minty. Thank you. Uh, just to add a further point which may assist the committee, we've talked about some of the distinctions and I'm sure we'll continue to talk about some of the distinctions that exist between a public prosecution and a private prosecution. It's also worth, um, and I think will be helpful going forward in terms of the potential subcategories of private prosecutions, um, because there are a the, the 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 label private prosecution can be applied to different scenarios. Here, obviously, we've heard evidence in relation to the post office as a private prosecutor, uh, one of many public authorities that brings prosecutions many of which are subject or part of the Whitehall Prosecutors Group, many of which will enjoy close working relationships with the Crown Prosecution Service and will consider themselves bound by, or will at least uh, apply what we've already heard, the Code for Crown Prosecutors, so therefore the full code test, and also the code of practice in the, uh, the, the, the governs the, the conduct of investigations. Yes. That is potentially a different scenario to uh, an individual or a corporate uh, who is a one-time say, private prosecutor uh, that maybe doesn't have those existing systems has a choice at that point um, as to whether or not to apply that full code test and we can obviously develop that further. And likewise in relation to the CPIA code, which I suspect we will touch on as well. Um, so I hope that's helpful, as I say, just to, to, to recognise going through it that there are different types of private prosecutor as well. Okay, yeah. yeah uh, may I just um, say something about the Private Prosecutors Association, which is a fairly recent body. First of all, it's not just individual prosecutors. A lot of our members defend them as well as prosecute. We have investigators, lawyers, all sorts of people who have an interest in how private prosecutions are conducted as part of our membership. And the idea was to formulate best practice in what can on occasions appear to be a bit of an ungoverned space and as I think you know because it's in our written evidence the first thing that we did was um, draft and put into practice a code for private prosecutors it doesn't have legislative force but we hope that through adoption first of all by those involved in bringing private prosecutions but also by the courts would lead to it getting universal acceptance and so for example one of the things that our code does is a recognition that is, our members may not be governed by the CPIA code for investigators, but if they're members of our organisation, then they agree to be bound by the CPIA 
code. So that, that is a way of trying to achieve parity and best practice in both kinds of prosecution. Okay, thanks very much. Well, we've heard from our previous witnesses and, and the other evidence we've had that actually there's been uh, an increase in private prosecutions over the last uh, few years. Um, I think that's generally seems to be accepted. If, if that is the case, what do you think drives any particular reason that pushes that along? Um, I think our first observation about that would be that it's peculiar that there is no data in relation to this. Whether or not there has been an increase in private prosecutions is entirely anecdotal because nobody gathers the data. And I think if you were to ask us for our recommendations, one of ours would be that HMCTS really needs to start gathering information about private prosecutions, the number, whether they increase, and what happens to them, particularly to see if numbers fail, and if so, for what reasons. That being said, our experience is that there has been an increase and that there's been a different kind of private prosecution starting to take place. Certainly when I first started at the bar, private prosecutions were often quite small affairs involving things like um, neighbour disputes over somebody having cut down somebody's clematis and somebody wants to bring a, a, a private prosecution for criminal damage. Increasingly now, they are being brought for large scale dishonesty offences, particularly fraud. and um, there appears to be, I mean, in terms of reasons why, possibly increased awareness is one reason, but it would be impossible, I think, not to conclude that there is a degree of frustration at what is perceived to be the underfunding and the, therefore the inability of the public authorities to bring as many as victims would like to see. And in some cases, a private prosecution may provide the only remedy through the criminal courts that a victim may have. I'll pass it over to the others to see what they think. Okay. That's right. And of course, I mean, the criminal courts then you can use proceeds of crime act and other things as a means of, right. of, of making a recovery. On yes. Uh, yeah, Mr. Minty, your thoughts? The only thing I would add to that, I think, is also a, a recognition that there are specialisms, specialisms that have arisen, um, whether that's in relation to, for example, the creative industries uh, and potential bodies there that, that know their industry particularly well and may be in a position to bring a properly objective and informed prosecution. Um, but subject to that, endorsing the same points that Alison's made in relation to, yes, partly it may be a, an increase, it may also be an increased awareness. Um, I would echo what she said in relation to data for a whole host of reasons. Yeah, okay, Mr Patel. Yes, I could, I could just repeat that. Um, although anecdotal, in my experience, there's been a greater take prohibitions for the reasons yeah. so far are given. Um, and so uh, I've not had other than that I think it should be possible to uh, uh, cater for those who uh, may wish to launch a private prosecution with closer collaboration with the public authorities and the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, it's one thing that I've learned in my experience is that uh, it, it would help private prosecutors. In an ideal world, uh, no person should have to dip into their own pockets to seek justice. Uh, but we know that resources are stretched. But I do think that there may, there may be some sort of means, a scheme whereby those who choose to go down the private prosecution route, uh, where it could be prosecuted by the Crown Prosecution Service, would possibly have to contribute to the funding of that uh, process in order to receive the facilities of the Crown Prosecution Service and possibly also the police in investigating crime. And so much. Would, would there, would there have perhaps to solve? Off the top of my head, be, be the objection taken. Well, um, does that potentially that funding potentially compromise the independence uh, of the Crown Prosecution under those circumstances? I, I, I don't think it would. I don't think if it's properly structured, I don't think it would because, um, as touched upon, there's been a recent increase in prosecutions involving large, uh, large substantial cases involving fraud by usually well resourced uh, organizations. And it's, it's a question which you may wish to consider is that in the circumstances where we have an overloaded uh, criminal justice system, where the inspector says that that will take, the existing backlog will take a decade to clear, that private prosecutors should have access to the same public facilities, the courts and so forth, whilst other cases, you know, burglaries and so forth have to wait. Uh, I do think that one of the things that 
arises from the post office experience is that if there was greater collaboration between the, the Crown Prosecution Service, the police, and so forth, I think a lot of the risk of, of, of miscarriage just be reduced. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anybody else want to, any other observations on that point before I move on? I think only just to, to echo uh, part of what Sandeep has said, which is that in our experience, this is not, um, there's no rivalry between the public and private parts of the system, and often it's a collaborative working arrangement. I think there is an acknowledgement by most of the players in the criminal justice system that even if the entire resources of the welfare state were put into the investigation and prosecution of fraud, the fraudsters might still well be two steps ahead of everybody and therefore it's not unreasonable for the state to ask the private sector to play its part, partly in resourcing it, but partly also in contributing its expertise and sharing the risk involved. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Paula Barker. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to our panel members for being here today. Um, do you think there are effective safeguards in place to prevent the right to bring private prosecutions being misused by public and private organisations? Uh, Alison, you go. You go okay. um, uh, yes, on balance, I think that we believe that there are in broad terms. Um, our experience has been, and we have nothing to go on other than that, that weak cases and unmeritorious cases are successfully weeded out at an early stage. The same is also true of the public sector, where, of course, there are sy systems of checks and balances in place to make sure that unmeritorious cases or weak ones are, are got rid of fairly um, early on. We're not aware, for example, of there being the post office case is a part, a deluge of appeals from wrongful, allegedly wrongful convictions involving private prosecutions. And we don't think there is anything that suggests that there is any greater danger from private prosecutions than public ones. The dangers are common to both part types. Uh, of course, we don't need to make the rather obvious point that all the big miscarriage of justice cases have in fact been public prosecutions. One of the things we would like to point to is the importance of a well-resourced defence. It is often going to be the defence team, as I say, some, many of our members defend as well as prosecute. It will be often the defence team that is needed to point out to the prosecutor, look, you could have done this, you could have done that, or to say to the court, you really need to examine the circumstances of this. And that is a really important safeguard. Okay, good. Gentlemen, who else put up any other observations? Yeah, go I would add just in terms of the safeguards that exist in relation to private prosecutions that the committee has has already touched on those partly in relation to the role that the CPS can play in that uh, and that is you know an important safeguard it is a right available to every single defendant it's an unfettered right um, and that is a right of review that does not for potentially perfectly understandable reasons would not you know would not apply in the equivalent situation of a public prosecution so there is that safeguard um, as the committee will be aware, private prosecutions will start through a judicial process. Um, there is obviously debate about that process and, and, and the checks and balances within that process itself, but nevertheless the application does go through a judicial process. Um, there is scope within that process for the defendant to be made aware of that application and invited to make representations on the case, which could be on the evidence, but it could also be on the motive or on the circumstances or the wider background. Um, the defendant has the right to seek to have that summons set aside but it's appropriate to seek judicial review of any refusal to, to grant that right. Um, those procedures aren't available in a public prosecution for reasons we understand. But once a public prosecution has started, the sort of stepping off points are relatively limited. Um, and I think there should be some reassurance that the committee can derive from the fact that there are those additional measures that are in place for a private prosecution and that's before the matter gets into the, the actual you know the full-blown proceeding stage when the defendant will have available to them the application to dismiss the charges to seek to stay the proceedings if they consider them to be an abuse of the court's process and um, to suggest there's no case to answer when the matter goes to trial those all follow but even at those early stages there are safeguards uh, which do it seems to me go some way to, to to, I would hope to balancing the interests of all of all interested parties at that stage. Yeah, Mr. Patel. Yes, thank you. I'd just add to that. Uh, I, I think that uh, additional safe 
could be introduced, uh, touching upon what's happened, what's been spoken about earlier about inadequate investigations. Uh, pr a private investigator is a disadvantage to a, 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 a public investigator, doesn't have the same resources and the powers to obtain material which might show a defendant's uh, innocence. And I, I, that's a, a concern which um, I think the committee may, may wish to consider. Um, it's already been touched on about um, uh, notifying the Crown Prosecution Service of uh, a private prosecution. I'm unaware of a central register, there one, but the committee may want to consider whether there's entry notification of a prosecution to the Crown Prosecution Service. At the moment, the position is the Crown Pros Prosecution Service might or might not adopt the case for review. It's discretionary. Perhaps a proposal that one would want, you would want to consider is the mandatory review of a private prosecution by the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, a private prosecution by the service in serious cases, those which might result in a loss of liberty. I think the types of additional safeguards which might improve the system uh, presently. Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah, does everyone want to come back? Yeah, may I just mention in terms of mandatory review, speaking um, as a former Crown Prosecutor myself, I think that there are real problems with there being mandatory referrals to the Crown Prosecution Service and they can broadly be um, split into three areas. Added bureaucracy, added delay and added cost. I don't think the Crown Prosecution Service would thank anybody for landing all private prosecutions on their desk, regardless of whether or not there was any particular need for them to look at them anyway. At the moment, there is the ability for the Crown Prosecution Service to review it when three people, three sets of people ask them to do so. The prosecution, the private prosecution themselves, the court has the power to do so if the court has any concerns, but most importantly, the defence. If the defence thinks something has gone wrong, they can ask the CPS to review it. It would, I think, be um, a, 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 a retrograde step to make it more expensive for any kind of prosecution to be brought because you run the risk of them making private prosecutions a tool only for the very wealthy. Okay, Paul. Okay, thank you. And how can an organisation conduct an objective investigation into alleged crimes when it's also the victim? Okay. Mr Patel, do you want to start on that one? And for any other observations? Uh, it, it, it's, it's the inherent dilemma in these matters, which I found in my experience, because ultimately, if the victim is the private prosecutor, the victim craves uh, retribution, and that's the objective of the victim. Uh, and it touches back on the uh, duplication of roles. The question is, how is that eliminated? Uh, I think, really, in an ideal world, they, those roles would have to be separated mm. so that the, the private prosecutor, the victim, would not have control over the private prosecution in the way that a private prosecutor does. One of the issues which are, uh, is a is problem is privilege. Communications between a, a client and a lawyer are covered by privilege. Let's say the private prosecutor says to the lawyer, you can't disclose that material because it be the end of the prosecution. I accept the proposal being made is that the lawyer can withdraw, but that's unsatisfactory for two reasons. The defendant will never know the reasons why the lawyer withdrew, because that would be covered by privilege. Uh, and secondly, you know, that could be at, a, at any stage in the proceedings. So that's obviously, let's say it's in the middle of a trial. That may result in delay, costs, which I, I would say is un, unsatisfactory. It may be a controversial proposal, but I would say that perhaps a private prosecutor should waive privilege from the outset. That is something which if it happened in the post office cases, might have concentrated the post office's mind in advance of making certain decisions. I mean, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I just, uh, those uh, just throw that out for your consideration. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, Mr. Minty. There's no doubt, as Mr. Patel says, that the, the role that privilege has to play in a private prosecution is is a delicate one. Um, and and reverting back to, to a topic that Alison touched upon, which is in relation to our code, which which gives guidance to 
um, private prosecutors and frankly anyone who, who is involved in a private prosecution as to the treatment of privileged material, um, which broadly results in a proposition that if material um, meets the test for disclosure, then the mere fact that it is also privileged would not be a shield to that item being disclosed. Now that's still a, ultimately, as Mr Patel says, a decision for the prosecutor to take um, and, and those who are instructed by him or her will, will have professional obligations that they will need to discharge at that, at that point. Um, certainly our, our advice when it comes to best practice would be that any um, investigation, any private prosecution should start on a footing that that material may well fall to be disclosed. Um, and, and to prepare and to conduct oneself accordingly. Um, it, it's also, it seems to be a, 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 an interesting point to keep in mind throughout all of this, that of course, the role that privilege has to play in a public prosecution, if someone is relieving, le receiving legal advice, that material doesn't have the same treatment as it would do if the person was the private prosecutor. So there are different considerations according to whichever scenario we are, we are addressing. Um, I, I personally, and I am only speaking personally, would not, w would not support a, a complete waiver of privilege, uh, but I do believe there are schemes and, and systems and processes that can be put in place that can ably manage that process. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Ms Levitt? Yeah. Nothing much to add. I mean, there is a gold standard that can be achieved in some prosecutions uh, where you, in effect, mirror what happens in the public sector. So you have independent investigators in the way that um, your first two witnesses <coughs> described, and then you have independent lawyers brought in as prosecutors. And in effect, there's a series of reviews. That's quite resource intensive, um, but it is a way in which an organization that has concerns about its independence can ensure that, that as I say, gold standard is met. Our experience has been that large organizations are usually extremely anxious to adhere to best practice. They are very respectful of the court's um, powers and processes, and they don't want to be seen to have in any way defied those and certainly not to be responsible for any kind of miscarriage of justice. But of course, um, this committee we understand is concerned not with those necessarily who are interested in the gold standard but how to protect against those who don't really care about such things if indeed there be such people okay yes yeah anything else Paula? no thanks chair okay uh, doctor here thank you chairman uh, uh to, to all the witnesses uh, really perhaps alison if, if you could start uh, are there any particular concerns over how uh disclosure works and um, we've touched on privilege but obviously this is a slightly different in terms of the evidence that, that's gathered in relation to private prosecutions? Well, disclosure problems have bedeviled the criminal justice system for years, for decades, probably as long as there's been any kind of criminal justice system um, in both public and private prosecutions. And the committee will, of course, be aware that the Attorney General is, in fact, looking at disclosure in criminal cases at the moment. And the Private Prosecutors Association Association has submitted evidence in relation to that. Um, there is an argument that in some ways disclosure is easier for the courts to police with private prosecutions because there can be literally no argument about what is in the possession of the private prosecutor. With public prosecutions, the police are dependent upon witnesses handing things over or volunteering things, whereas with the private prosecutor, it's there, you know that you've got it, it's just a question of getting them to, um, to dislodge it. Again, the code that we have drafted, we think provides guidance, not just for how prosecutors should adopt best practice, but so that defendants can look at the code and say, these are the standards that should be adhered to. And you try and use that to get the courts to enforce it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Happy with that. The only observation I would make, it, it follows on from Alison's point about disclosure being a universal issue. The fact that the attorney is once again, and, and understandably so, looking at the, the, the evolution of disclosure, particularly when it comes to technology yeah. uh, and the amount of data that can be generated in criminal investigations. I mean, as the committee will be aware, the, 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 the attorney general's guidelines, it was only in 2000, um, and 11, I believe, that, that a supplementary uh, set of guidelines was issued specifically to deal with digital material. Yeah. Um, subsequently, that's obviously quite sensibly being sort of consolidated into the main body of the guidelines. But, uh, but just to show the evolution, you know, looking at the time frame over which this committee is considering from the post office cases perspective, 
you know, there have been, you know, a number of revisions to the attorney's guidelines. There's been changes in the disclosure law, uh, uh, as the chair alluded to at the, earlier, the, the, the review that's happened in the last couple of years, indeed, in relation to disclosing from a policing perspective. Um, I think that sets into, into, into context that um, there, there will be issues. They will, they will beset private and public cases. What is in those documents, of course, is a clear set of principles and guidelines. Um, which if, if one frames one's case around those, um, at least gives one a fighting chance of, of, of proceeding fairly and, and proportionally forward. Would you perhaps have any sympathy with the idea that when it comes to traditional prosecutions by the police um, uh, and CPS, you know, they're public bodies, it might, one might argue that the individuals working within that system perhaps are um, held to a higher standard than just Joe Bloggs working in a company who happens to be embarking on a public on a private prosecution i mean i, I, I recognize of course that whether it's at the crown prosecution service or, or any of the other sort of white hall prosecutors they will be subject to for example you know the civil service code if that's appropriate in those particular situations many of them will have their own professional obligations that they need to discharge but then so do we in a in a in a, in a private um context um yes i would accept that those are additional sort of considerations that will fall into play in those in those circumstances um however yeah we unfortunately history teaches us we we can't rule out that notwithstanding those guiding principles like the civil service code that the problems won't won't arise um that comes back to culture in many respects um and and we've touched on it already i think in the course of giving this evidence the right culture and all of these systems will 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 work um, whether that's public or private and um, there might be different levers in play and different considerations but ultimately I think it will come back to that central question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to add before I move on? No, no I, I just add to that I would agree to that um, but there is also the inherent tension which we alluded to uh, is that a, a public body is not invested in a, in a, in a private outcome so uh, you speak about the Crown Prosecution Service, their statutory duty and mandate is to act as ministers of justice. Uh, it's, it's not, it's a very different role than played by, played out by a solicitor for a private prosecutor, the Minister of Justice. And that, that inherently that's the tension in the process, uh, which uh, needs to be reconciled. Yes, but though uh, in some of the evidence as you mentioned it, some of the evidence put forward suggests that actually the uh, the council uh, for a private prosecution is actually acting as a, a minister for justice and and should behave you know in accordance with that. Uh, is anyone aware of any examples where retrospectively where a case has been thrown out when it's been found that actually that prosecution wasn't valid, that any actions ever taken to hold that individual to account to suggest that that mechanism has any teeth? Anybody have any experience of that? Can we help with that? No, I'm not. I'm not aware of it, any such circumstances. But it, it goes back to the council, independent advocate, can only carry out his or her uh, obligations and duties if fully informed. Yes, I understand that. Thank you. Okay, uh, I just want to talk about the another one of the safeguards that uh, we've talked about, which is the CPS and no ability to take over or discontinue a, a, a prosecution. Uh, just, just interested, again, if we start with you, Alison, just what your views on the effectiveness of that. Keeping in mind, I don't know if you heard the previous panel we heard, or actually we were talking about the post office and, and the evidence we were advised was that as far as our witnesses were concerned, uh, no one, uh, despite the volume of cases concerned in that instance, had actually sought the support of the CPS as a mechanism of protecting themselves from an appropriate prosecution. And no doubt that'll be something that the Court of Appeal wants to consider when it's looking at these cases. I don't know enough about those cases, so I can't obviously comment on that. Um, the ability of the CPS to scrutinise these cases is a really vital safeguard, particularly for defendants, because um, the, the defendant who is facing a private prosecution can ask the CPS to review the case at any stage, not just before it starts or not just even just after it starts. And the reason it matters is because, as I think is known, the CPS applies something called the full code test 
as to whether prosecution should be allowed to either start or continue. And it's got two stages to it, not just whether there are enough is enough evidence for the case to be brought at all, but whether there is what is called a realistic prospect of conviction, more likely than not that the defendant will be convicted. Even if it passes that stage of the test, the public prosecutor then goes on to consider whether or not the prosecution is in the public interest. At the point at which the private, the defendant facing a private prosecution asks them to take it over, they will look at both stages of that test. I've heard it suggested that there is no remedy for a defendant facing a private prosecution to say, well, it's not in the public interest. That simply isn't right. You can say to the CPS, please look at the public interest test. This is a protection that was, as it were, um, increased in 2009 by the then Director of Public Prosecutions, who changed the test. The original test for the CPS to take over and discontinue was merely whether there was not enough evidence to provide a case to answer. The then DPP said it should be the same test as for public prosecutions, namely yep. the one that I have just described. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. No. Can I just, uh, just on that point then, and, and looking at it from the other angle, again from some of the evidence we've received, yep. there, there's a kind of a flip concern there that actually uh, one of the arguments put forward for the benefit of private prosecutions is actually you might proceed with a prosecution that for broader reasons wouldn't meet a public interest test, but that's not to say that an offence hasn't been committed and a private individual hasn't got a right to pursue that. Um, do, do you, as it stands at the moment, the CPS can take over a case, they can agree that it was actually a, a legitimate um, a case and then shut it down because it doesn't meet the public interest test and but for going to judicial review, uh, the, the private prosecutor just has to accept that. Um, is there downsides to that as well? Well, there's also something called the Victim Right of Review Scheme, which again was put in um, okay. some years ago, which does not require um, having to go through formal or the okay. expense of judicial review. So there, there are a number of safeguards. The CPS don't just get to do it on a sort of um, a, a whimsical or capricious okay. approach. There's okay. got to be according to legal okay. principles. But it is true that there can be disagreement between um, pr you know, responsible prosecutors. The test as to whether or not there is a realistic prospect of conviction it's an objective one but it requires an estimate of an, sure. an exercise of judgment and that can often be very finely balanced but on the whole i think most people would say that the ability of the cps to look at this is an important safeguard to make sure that nothing has gone wrong with the bringing of the case in the first thank part. you I, I think i think you're right i guess the, the the evidence we heard before might might identify that there's an ignorance amongst people of that safeguard and do you have any ideas for how we might tackle that that gap in defenders' knowledge is it? They don't get legal advice, so they just don't know that that can do that. Well, we suggest that, I mean, we mention it in our code, and you know that one of our recommendations will be that a co our code or something that looks very like it should have legislative force because it's a simple, concise document, draws everything together. One of the problems, for example, with disclosure is that the sources of this information is often an awful lot of in, in an awful lot of different places. If lawyers can't access this in an easy way, what hope does the poor layperson confronted with this have? If something like our code has legislative force in there, there's an entire chapter on the Crown Prosecution Service and how they get to hear of it and what happens when they do. And that would definitely be one way of making sure sure that lay people understood it with or without the benefit of legal advice. Thank you. That's Thanks, great. Thank you very much. Mr Daly. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, could you, I, I think you've, you've made this clear, but just for, for clarity, um, the Private Prosecutors Association, could you just explain how that's been formed and who, apart from your good selves, who, who's involved in that and what's sort of, the, what's the basis of your I won't say authority, but the basis of your standing. Is it, is it simply that you're the only people who come together to form an association? Or is there some other reason for you uh, doing it? Gareth, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, it, it, okay, the, um, as, we, as we've set up, I think, it, it was formed in 2017. Um, its membership is broad. It involves uh, practitioner lawyers on both sides of, of, of a case, investigators, uh, accountants, anyone uh, who has an interest in the bringing of private prosecutions. Um, its authority, if I can call it that, is derived from a shared uh, 
uh, interest and a shared, frankly, commitment to making sure that cases are brought properly and in accordance with well-recognized principles. Um, as we make clear, our code is a voluntary code, but for those who wish to be part of the association, we, we ask that they follow the code wherever they can, in, you know, in accordance with their professional obligations. Whether, you know, it, it's for everyone is obviously a matter for them to decide. Um, it, 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 it is not, of course, a manual, and that's important to stress with the code. It is, it is a, an attempt to articulate some guiding principles um, which cross over with a number of other sources of information that are scattered across the criminal justice system that people can then draw upon if they require further assistance. So there's not, in some respects, you know, there are elements of that which will not be novel to many people who are practicing, but it is that idea of bringing it all into one place and not a number of disparate different sources so that you can have ready access to those principles. That, that's how it's come about. Um, and it, it intends to, I suppose, evolve in that way with, you know, you know, it, it, inquiries like today will yeah. potentially bring about changes that should then be reflected in an updated code in due course. Thank you. Uh, just moving on, because time is, time is ticking on. Um, I worked in the criminal courts for 16 years. And sometimes when we have these discussions in the committee, um, the impression that is given sometimes is, is that this has been a, a, a sort of issue before the courts for 16 years, which has been the discussion, you know, it has been discussed by lawyers. My experience of dealing with these matters, and the magistrates' courts in particular, was that many of them, or the vast majority of cases, appeared to be uh, conducted in a, an appropriate manner. I mean, we, we, we obviously don't want to discuss the, the litigation that is ongoing at this moment in time. But, you know, organisations like the RSPCA... Um, and others who, who prosecuted did carry out investigations in a proper way where evidence was disclosed um, and the case was prosecuted by qualified solicitors and barristers. Is my recollection of that incorrect or have I, have, was, is this a, a, a serious problem that's been bedeviling the courts for the last two decades? I think, um, I think we would, would want to endorse what you're saying and that whatever happened in the post office case we would want to make sure that that wasn't seen as representative of an endemic problem across private prosecutions. Um, as we've already alluded to there are a number of tensions that exist in private prosecutions but in our view the courts are alert to those and well equipped to deal with them and it's very important not to remove or reduce access to a remedy that may be the only remedy that some victims are able to get. It's also got quite an important deterrent effect. For example, copyright offences. Copyright offences might not seem that serious to ordinary members of the public, but they're very specialist and they are a form of theft and they affect a lucrative industry. Often those are brought as private prosecutions and those who are tempted to contravene copyright need to know that there will be those who will not accept the theft of their intellectual property. Okay. Just one final, very quick point, and this is just to clarify. Why, in your, you, you've been practitioners for many, many years, and perhaps you can't answer this question, but some of these organisations, why aren't they referring matters to the police? Why are they actually, why are they, why are they carrying out private prosecutions in the sense of a theft is a theft, a fraud is a fraud? So for the post office or for the Royal Mail or for other organisations, do you have any reason as to why the matter is not referred to the police and go, goes to the Crown Prosecution Service instead? Well, well, Often it is referred to the police um, and I think it's well, I don't want to be critical of our uh, friends and colleagues in law enforcement, but I think they would accept that it's very difficult for them to take on board every single case that is referred to them. Sometimes the risk involved and the financial outlay involved in the investigation and prosecution is too great or the waiting list is too long and it can be that that can lead the, the, the victim to say they going to look at the private prosecution route. Sometimes they have particular expertise within the organisation. I've just given the example of copyright theft. Yeah. That's quite specialist areas. Yeah. Um, those are part of the reasons. The others may have other things to contribute to that. And the other views? I, I would probably just echo what Alison said. I mean, there's, there, we go back to our data point as well. Um, and one of the recent changes has been the evolution of the application form that one needs to complete in order to launch a private prosecution, which now collects more information, involves declarations on the part of the private prosecutor. Right. And that discharge of their duty of candour should properly include explaining whether or not the matter has been brought to the attention of the law enforcement authorities and what decision they've made. 
And again, depending on how ambitious you were in relation to trying to collect that data, it would make an interesting study to see how many matters had been through that route, but had nevertheless ended up with a private prosecution and to see how they'd ended up both in relation to whether or not the CPS had become involved and the outcome of the case and the sentence. Um, there is potentially, as I say, a, a very interesting project that could be done there to understand those behaviours a bit more and perhaps what could be done to change them or improve the situation, I don't know. But there is, there is the potential to collect it and to get a far greater, I think, level of insight than we do already have. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. So any other observations? No, I'd just like to echo that. I think, Gareth, that's a, that would be a very useful exercise to uh, gather data on why an organisation has or has not chosen to refer a matter to the police, for instance, and what the reason was for why the police didn't adopt the case. It would also be very interesting to know why an organisation chose not to refer a matter to the police, because at the moment, as the rules stand, there's no legal rule which compels an organisation to notify the police or the Crown Prosecution Service at all. So I think that would be a very useful exercise. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying. Any other questions from any members of the committee to, to this panel of witnesses? If not, yeah, no. I, yeah, 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 Mr. Smolter. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm putting words in your mouth, but you seem to be, be saying that there are there are opportunities where private prosecutors, either through specialist knowledge or possibly just space, could fill the gap which the CPS. Uh, may not have the resources to do. I mean, do you see therefore any uh, any room for the expansion of um, private prosecution? Um, an, an example is the SFO has prosecuting rights at the moment. One of the issues that we often get raised is online fraud, which the police and CPS are, seem singularly uh, not unwilling but uh, uh, unable to deal with. Would you see as a possibility of expansions along those lines or other areas? Without question, and I think there's quite a lot of appetite in government for considering public-private partnerships in relation to um, criminal prosecutions. What role, what safeguards, what are the risks, um, How? what actions you could take to minimise those risks. Could you, for example, have memoranda of understanding between private law firms and uh, public law enforcement, whereby the, the law enforcement use some of their specialist powers, but they're co compensated for doing so, that sort of thing. Um, I think that an adventurous and ambitious criminal justice system that is really serious about rooting out economic crime has got to be prepared to take a fresh look at these things. Otherwise, you just run the risk that the fraudsters just continue to get away with it. Okay. Yeah. May I just add, it's a very small point, the, the online fraud is, is, a, is, if I may say, a very good example of what may be a perfectly benign reason why a matter proceeds down a private route. And that may be as simple as evidence capture and the opportunities which are, that window is extremely small in many cases, we all know. And whether that's, you know, tracing funds, whether that's freezing assets, whatever that might be, circumstances may not permit that all to have been done through a police route. And that may not be anyone's fault, but just a reflection of the systems and the way in which crime is reported. And then the matter may well proceed down that route. And I just flagged that, as I say, a benign reason why the matter might proceed down that route, which is not critical of anyone, but it's just reflective of the need in, in that situation, potentially to protect a victim's, a victim's interests. Um, there is obviously a number of different scenarios that one can envisage here, and it doesn't necessarily reduce itself to one answer. But um, if I may, I thought that was a good, um, a good example. That's helpful. Thank you. OK, fine. That's, that's, that's very helpful, everyone. Thank you all very much. Um, for your, your time and your evidence uh, uh, this afternoon. That's been, been very useful to us. So I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Seeing some of you again, all the rest. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And we'll move now to our, our, our third panel, if I may. Have we got the, the witnesses for the third panel, please? I think we should it's have a bit. <laughs> yep, every, every, everybody's here by the, by the look. Um, if then perhaps we can uh, just uh, ask you to introduce uh, yourselves, uh, please. Uh, Professor Dathan. Hello, um, I'm Claire Dathan. I'm a professor of law and I am a law commissioner in Jersey. Right, okay. And next to you is 
Uh, Dr. Elvin, I'm a senior lecturer in law at the City Law School, uh, City University of London. Right, thanks, Dr. Jesse Elvin. And then uh, Professor um, Hungerford Welch. Hello, uh, also from uh, the City Law School at City University of London. Um, I'm a professor of law with a, a specialism in criminal procedure, <coughs> uh, and I contribute to uh, Blackstone's criminal practice, which is one of the uh, main practitioner works. Uh, used in the criminal courts and uh, work on the criminal law review as well. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, Dr. Rogers. Hello, my name is Jonathan Rogers. I'm at the University of Cambridge and Fitzwilliam College. Uh, I'm on the editorial board of the Criminal Law Review. I'm actually speaking to you today as the co-director of the Criminal Law Reform Network uh, because we started our own project on private prosecutions and we can be Great. Well, I've got to say, the first case I did that was ever reported was in the Criminal Law Review. It was a, it's a very long time ago, though, so I've a, 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 a long-term affection for, 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 for the art, for, for the magazine, for, 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 for the journal. Very good. I'll pass it on. Thanks, thanks very much. OK. Nobody, nobody there will remember it now, I'm sure. But uh, there we go. Uh, uh, Mr McCaskill, you're going to start with these. With yes, thank you. I was just asking the panel what you thought the advantages or disadvantages are of the private prosecution model. And in comparison, how, for example, with regard to my own jurisdiction of Scotland that has a different way of having it dealt with through the Crown, what does it say, the pros and cons, and whether there are merits or demerits regarding the alternative methods. Well, shall, shall I kick off? Um, I, I think the main advantage of private prosecution is it enables uh, a citizen who feels they've been uh, the victim of crime to secure the bringing of a prosecution, even if the state, uh, represented by the police and the Crown Prosecution Service, are unable or unwilling to take the case on. Um, as we've heard from other witnesses, um, resource issues uh, for the police and for CPS mean that a lot of crime, even where there is, is some evidence as to who committed it, um, isn't actually taken at the criminal courts. Uh, and so it is filling that uh, gap. Um, the downside um, is, as has been discussed by other witnesses, it is a little bit difficult where you have a prosecutor who has a direct interest in the outcome of the case because they are the victim. Um, the idea of the prosecutor as a minister of justice, lowercase m, lowercase j, is much more difficult to achieve uh, if uh, you are the victim of the offence um, and you're the one bringing the case. Um, I can't profess to uh, detailed knowledge of the Scottish system, but I, I, I am aware that there is a process to be gone through in order to, uh, uh, to bring uh, a, a non-state prosecution. In a sense, what we have in England and Wales is similar in that, as we've heard, a private prosecution is commenced by applying to a magistrate's court for a summons, that used to be a, a rubber stamp exercise. Uh, the divisional court uh, in a case called K um, changed all that, reminding magistrates it's a judicial function and giving them a list of things they need to think about uh, before issuing the summons. Um, a lot of what the court said in that case has now been enshrined in the criminal procedure rules, uh, so further emphasizing uh, the, the need for a judicial decision at the point of issuing the proceedings. So there is a, a safeguard which is, is different to what uh, uh, you have in Scotland, but is, is, is certainly analogous to it. Thanks. Who else would like to, to help around this topic? Don't well, you. may I say a couple of words? Oh, yes, I promise. First, I have nothing much to add to the advantages of private prosecutions because I think they've been uh, relayed to you clearly already. The police and the CPS do not have the resources to prosecute everything. Uh, and there are some specialist prosecutors and some very rich private prosecutors who could very arguably do the job better. Um, I'd like to say a couple of words rather about the drawbacks of private prosecutions, because I think a lot of people tend to think that there's something kind of suspect about a private prosecution. Um, and to some extent, we have to be careful about people who exaggerate the drawbacks. 
the first thing to say is that a lot of things that can go wrong in private prosecutions can and do go wrong in CPS prosecutions as well. The first thing you should really think about when you hear about uh, when you hear a private when you hear a horror story about a private prosecution, the first thing you should ask yourself is, well, could that actually have happened with the police and CPS as well? And often the answer is yes. Um, the other thing I would say is that people often think that victims who privately prosecute uh, can't be objective about the strength of the evidence which a court will have to act upon. Um, but one thing to say in response to that, and it was something Alison Levitt, I think, mentioned earlier, is that there is no such thing as an objectively correct answer as to whether a case should go ahead or not. If the evidence is unclear, two Crown prosecutors could disagree among themselves as to whether the case should go ahead or not. Um, so to say that the CPS has an objective correct answer and that the victim stroke private prosecutor must be wrong if he disagrees with it is clearly not correct. Thanks very much, yes. Um, uh, Professor Dutan, Dr Elvin, any, any observations for Mr McCaskill? Um, yeah, so many advantages and disadvantages have already been mentioned, so I won't repeat what, what other people have said. But um, one of the um, arguments that's sometimes made in favour of the right to start a private prosecution is it saves as a, serves as a kind of safeguard against, um, you know, perhaps corruption in the police or the CPS. Um, I'm not saying that there is a, a big problem with the corruption or sort of capricious um, action by the police or the CPS, but um, I think a lot of members of the public have that perception. And uh, there are opinion polls that, that show that quite a, um, a large section of the public don't, don't have trust in the CPS. So in that sense, you could say, in as far as people are aware of the right to privately prosecute, that it might reassure the public that there's kind of an alternative way of bringing prosecution. Um, on the gap filling point, um, that, that often is, is an argument that's made for the right to privately prosecute. But it's, what I'd say about that in terms of a potential drawback mm -hmm. is that although it takes quite a lot of money, I think, to start a private prosecution, um, often um, funds are recovered that are spent on the private prosecution from uh, what's called the central funds, as, as you're probably aware already. And so it's not necessarily the case that the state doesn't end up paying for a private prosecution. Um, so sometimes you know, you could, it might be um, the state ends up paying more because of the right to private prosecute. And uh, another point that I think is worth mentioning in terms of uh, potential drawbacks for private prosecutions is um, in, it's, it's hard to actually be sure exactly how it's used in practice this right in the absence of any real sort of concrete statistics about it but there's obviously a potential for what you might call wealth discrimination now, it takes quite a lot of money to to start a private prosecution and that's often why it seems like large organizations are bringing them rather than private individuals and you could ask well is it, is, is it appropriate that people with more money or more resources are more able to make use of the criminal law what, what about crowdfunding? That seems to be a, a, a popular measure now, doesn't it, to, to bring private prosecutions? Uh, yeah, as you've probably noticed, there have been a few crowdfunding uh, initiatives in relation to uh, yeah. certain individuals. Um, yeah, I mean, so some of them, they don't seem to reach their targets in terms of crowdfunding. Uh, I'm aware of maybe two or three cases like that. Um, you know, okay. obviously one of your colleagues in Parliament <laughs> knows more about that. Um, but I think, I'm not sure how far that trend will take off, but you know, potentially that gets around the sort of wealth discrimination point, as long as you can, you know, attract enough t attention to get, get the donations. You, you, you might get your costs back from central funds. It's not guaranteed, I suppose, is that? No, 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 it's not, it's not guaranteed, but just because you don't actually win the case doesn't mean you, you don't get your funds back. No, I accept that. Yeah. yeah. Anything you tried, Professor Tatan? No, we're um we're basically working as a team today. Right, whichever whichever of you wants, that's fine. <laughs> uh, anything else for Mr. McCaskill's question, Mr. Kenny? Anything else from you? Uh, yeah, I think you're muted, Kenny. <laughs>
No, that, I said that's fine for me. I think that uh, puts matters on the record. Great. I'd be happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, if I can move to Andy Slaughter, please. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, you, you've, you, you, you've touched on this slightly already in terms of the um, right or wrong uh, views of the, the merits of, of private prosecutions as opposed to, to, to public ones. I don't know if you were here for the first panel and talking about the way that the, the, the post office proceeded. You said that well, one obvious issue with private prosecutions is that the prosecutor may be the victim or may have an interest that goes just beyond the ordinary interest of justice case. But in the case of the post office, it appeared to go much further than that. It appeared that it, this was a, a sort of manipulation uh, in, uh, in, in, its, in its own cause. Are you aware of, of other, can I call them abuses of that kind, other prosecutors who've acted in that way, um, uh, either that have been identified or that you're aware of? Um, and you think should be looked at again? Professor Dutan, I think you were catching my eye. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, obviously, yes, we're all going to say the same thing many times about the absence of publicly available data. Um, so it does make it difficult to make generalisations, but we have quite a big pool of the available data because right. we've written several large articles about this and, and we have a research centre on private prosecution. Um, we are aware, particularly in cases involving large organisations as the victim private prosecutor, of some very similar problems and patterns to those in the post office cases. Mm -hmm. So I've just run through some of the things which the first panel picked up and confirmed that we do have evidence. Um, won't always say the name of the organisation now, <laughs> in spite of privilege, but it, it's in our writing. Because if anything which uh, impinges upon the sub judice rule, we couldn't. Yes, exactly. So yeah. I'm going, I, I may go vague. Um, if I go vague, then anyone who wants to know more specific detail can, of course, contact us afterwards. And it's in, probably in something we wrote earlier. So um, subject to the problem of, of having a complete database on private prosecutions. Firstly, um, we do have evidence of cases where there have been significant failures to disclose relevant evidence to defendants in other contexts, in other cases involving large organisations as private prosecutors. And these have been within the vast majority of private prosecutions, which seem to be brought by well-resourced vocal organisations protecting their commercial interests. Um, so these are commercial organisations rather than public bodies, you're saying? Yes, yes. So it, you have to be a little bit careful there with, you know, the difference between, well, at least three groups of large organisations. You've got the charities, you've got the public bodies, and you've got the strong commercial bodies. And they get conflated very often with the individual crime victim who hasn't had justice and the benefits and detriments of, I think it's a power to private prosecutions than a right, rather than a right, the benefits and detriments of that power are hugely different in the different contexts. We've also got evidence, moving on from disclosure, of lack of effective and fair investigations from large commercial organizations and charities. <clears throat> and one of our other pieces of research uh, that we've done in the past is about the use of private investigators um, in, private investi uh, in private prosecutions and in public-private partnerships and how those private investigators are untrained and very often do not follow best practice would be a good way of putting it. Okay. Building on from that, we have a lot of, uh, we've identified a lot of cases where the threat of private prosecution is being used to leverage guilty pleas to lesser offences and again, often by large organisations of several types. Um, we've had, we've got cases where large commercial organisations have run dawn raids and um, threatened a prosecution unless uh, personal property or intellectual property is signed over to the, pri to the potential private prosecutor. And we've also got evidence of profit making companies, some of them performing quasi-public functions, <laughs> um, 
doing inappropriate plea bargaining on individuals. Um, for example, keep it vague, railway companies. Um, convincing people who have not actually committed any offence, but merely a ticket has blown out of their hand, uh, or they're unable to find it at the right time, uh, to settle out of court by pleading guilty to a lesser offence, when there would have been no prospect of proving a more senior, serious offence, an intent-based offence in a private prosecution. That comes back to that, that is that's going to be an, an objective. Is that objective or subjective? That sort of as to whether or not it's possible. Mm. There'd been no prospect of proving it. Mm. Yeah. We can't. So it's, it's a, people might come to different views on that, mightn't they? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Can I just say a word or two about these railway cases, which Claire refers to? Yes. Um, there are, as you know, different types of criminal offences. There are strict liability offences, whereby mm. the person could be convicted even if it's not really at fault. And these can apply to railway evasion yes. cases. And so the real problem, which Claire refers to, with um, heavy-handed prosecutions of people who have technically committed uh, a fair evasion case when they weren't truly at fault, is that actually an offence is committed and so a private prosecution for the offence could in law succeed and the argument is that the companies who choose to enforce it are not keeping an eye on what you might call common sense or the greater public interest. I, I think that's probably what Claire means. You, you could apply public oh. interest if you were a prosecutor, couldn't you? In theory. Wait, <laughs> cases which you might hope a responsible prosecutor might discontinue for lack of public interest yeah, yeah. Yeah. Public and, and further that defences are not examined because the people initiating the prosecutions are not concerned about potential defences okay. Professor Hungerford what, what, what are the views? Yeah I I, I, I defer to um, uh, Dr Urban and Professor Tan for, for, for the examples of um, poor practice. <clears throat> the, the, the only one which um, you know I was particularly aware of um, was a charity um, involving animals. I should say no more. Uh, <laughs> beyond uh, a reputation for somewhat overzealous uh, prosecution, uh, whether that reputation is well founded or not, I won't comment. There's been some uh, around that, really, hasn't there? Okay. But um, I. Uh, Picking up on uh, what one or two of the points with which have, have been made, I, I think the, the the issue revolves around there being a lack of supervision of private prosecutions um, in contrast to public prosecutions. Uh, in terms of plea bargaining, for example, um, it, whether it's a private prosecution or a public prosecution, there's there is always scope for a conversation uh, about the defendant pleading guilty to a lesser offence um, rather than having a trial. But you know, if you're a Crown prosecutor, you know you will know the rules which govern that process. And indeed, there's Attorney General's guidance on it, uh, which as a Crown prosecutor, you have to comply with. In a private prosecution scenario, it's a, a little bit more open-ended. Um, if lawyers are involved, they will have professional responsibilities, uh, which would include you know, responsible plea bargaining, uh, whether they're solicitors or barristers, you know, there are the professional codes um, which, which they should observe. Uh, but of course, some of these conversations may well be conducted by people uh, who are not uh, lawyers, not bound by professional codes, and who may not uh, know where the line is drawn. Uh, and, and so there may be cases where what would have been a, an entirely appropriate discussion about uh, the potential of pleading to a lesser offence turns into what has been described by earlier witnesses as bullying. Uh, it is a fine line. I would like to think practitioners know where it is, uh, but non-lawyers may well not know. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Now, finally, say a couple of things leading on from Peter's valuable observations. Um, first of all, about oversight of prosecuting authorities, uh, only the CPS and the SFO are actually inspected. So when we refer to other public bodies, i.e. government departments, they are not inspected. Right. Uh, other functions of public bodies may be reviewed and inspected, but not particularly and discreetly their prosecutorial functions. Um, and 
what the committee may well think is the best way forward at the end of the day is to have a more rigorous inspection system uh, for large prosecutors. And you may well straddle the public-private divide. Going back to the RSPCA, um, I, can, I believe you're going to hear evidence from them separately, um, but they did invite in an inspector uh, some five years ago after they got some bad press and they have reformed their practices. It may well turn out to be that the RSPCA is a good example of an organization which responds well to inspection, but there is no power to order inspection for the CPS or SFO. That's very helpful. Thank you. Well, yeah. well, one other question, I mean, that all sounds rather grim. Um, I won't ask you about the reining in, because I think one of my colleagues is going to deal with regulation of private prosecutors, but um, we seem to be putting out this pattern of where the CPS is stretched and does not have the capacity to deal with particularly specialist niche areas or possibly less uh, ser serious crimes. And the private prosecutors do have that, but are liable to go astray, to go off on a frolic of their own. What, what's the solution to this? I mean, we, you were talking about the Scottish system earlier. If I understand it, the Scottish system is that you do have private bodies, but they have to refer through the procurator fiscal. I mean, is there a, a middle way here, perhaps, where you have the private prosecutors preparing the cases, doing the legwork, but they're still being a filter through to ensure that rules of evidence and things like that are, are obeyed, that i.e. that the CEPF comes in at a later stage? Yeah, any thoughts? Who wants to start with that? Yeah, um, Claire, do you want to have a go? Yes, um, we did actually propose that in, in one of the things we wrote earlier. Uh, we proposed a compulsory regulator for any organisation bringing private prosecutions because we're concerned about equality of justice, um, equal access to the law for people who may not have had anything to do with an offence but find themselves defending one um, against a very powerful organization. So we think there should be inspections and of course some of our other recommendations such as a compulsory code with real teeth feed in. I can certainly see the advantage of um, some, some kind of approval process um, but I, I, I think if um, Alison Levitt uh, was still present she might wish to repeat a comment she made earlier uh, that if you're thinking about CPS um, taking on that role, um, they, they they simply do not have the capacity. Um, That's um, I, I I wonder if a, a, another approach is to look again at the stage when proceedings are initiated. Um, I mentioned the the High Court and the Criminal Procedure Rules Committee beefing up the scrutiny which takes place at the summons uh, yeah. application stage, it may well be um, that more detail could be required in terms of uh, uh, the evidence in the case and why the prosecution is being brought. Um, what the rules currently say is you have to summarise uh, the evidence you've got and essentially um, confirm in writing uh, that you have that evidence available um, and you, you will be able to reduce it at trial. Um, it would be possible, for example, to require draft witness statements uh, to show that there is uh, sufficient evidence. Um, as far as um, the, the test to be applied is concerned, um, there's been a bit of discussion about the approach taken by the Crown Prosecution Service and uh, reference to the full code test, which um, Alison um, kindly um, defined for us. I, as far as the law stands, um, the, the full code test doesn't apply to private prosecutions. Um, the full code test, just to remind everyone, first of all, is there sufficient evidence to give a realistic prospect of conviction? Secondly, even if is it in the public interest? Now, this is one of the controversies that arose uh, when the DPP decided 
uh, when taking over private prosecutions to apply the full code test. Uh, a case went all the way to the Supreme Court where it was argued that if the DPP can take over a private prosecution and apply the full code test, that subverts the right to bring private prosecutions. Uh, the Supreme Court disagreed uh, with, with, with that argument um, and held that it was appropriate if the, the DPP is taking over a prosecution uh, to apply that full code test. As, as has been said by several witnesses, um, whether there is a realistic prospect of conviction depends on your analysis of the evidence. There'll be cases where um, you know, two, two lawyers could come to opposite conclusions on that. In terms of the, the public interest test, I can see why um, it might be thought, well, how on earth could that possibly relate to a private prosecution, which by its definition is private. So why apply the public interest test? I think the short answer to that is, if you look at the full code test in, in the Code for Crown Prosecutors, it does make the point that if there is sufficient evidence, think of a realistic prospect of conviction, there should be a prosecution unless there's a good reason not to prosecute. Uh, 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 and therefore applying the full code test um, you know, should not subvert um, the, the existence of private prosecutions. The real problem I think uh, that, that's been revealed by a lot of these uh, cases is defendants who are the subject of a private prosecution not knowing what to do. Now, of course, they can go and see a solicitor, and hopefully the solicitor would, would give um, decent advice. But I, I wonder if perhaps when the summons is issued in a private prosecution, the defendant uh, could be given paperwork, which includes explicit reference to the power of the DPP to take over uh, prosecutions, so that someone who's in that situation knows uh, that if they do feel that the prosecution is being brought or conducted inappropriately, they can refer it to CPS, who can decide whether to take it over or not. Um, and were the committee to, to, to go with the suggestion made by um, earlier witnesses of a, a statutory code, um, perhaps based on the Private Prosecutor, uh, Prosecutors Association code, um, Again, a defendant in a private prosecution you know, could receive a copy of that with the summons to the court so they know what their rights are and they know what, what they can do if they feel it is an improper uh, prosecution. Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah. And for, can, I, can I just come in finally? Um, I'm going to agree with Peter that it would be better if defendants to private prosecutions were made aware of their rights to ask the CPS to take over and discontinue them. Uh, and it may well be that adding a couple of sentences on the summons sheet uh, is quite practical and would help a lot. Uh, the point I was going to make is that sometimes in the investigations, uh, the police are actually involved in some minor way, perhaps to search premises or to effect an arrest. And I imagine that when the police are involved, uh, the defendant is probably very prone to imagine that he's being uh, prosecuted by the CPS. And it may not be obvious to him that it even is a private prosecution, let alone that he can ask the DPP to yeah. take it over. But going back finally to the question asked of us, should the everything go through the CPS? Uh, well, we do have to, I think, look at the limited resources. What I'd rather um, happen is that the CPS asks more questions when the defendant does ask them to take it over and does that job properly, rather than that as a part of every single uh, private prosecution. That's helpful. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Sorter? You happy with that? Thanks very much. Dr. Mullen, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've touched on some of this already. Uh, I just wonder if there's any of the key elements that we haven't discussed about the existing uh, safeguards in place for private prosecutions. And just on the issue of the CPS referral, it occurs to me that you might find yourself in a situation where every defendant sent their case for review by the CPS. Uh, we've seen evidence from the committee that that process adds many, many months to a pr prosecution potentially. Uh, uh, do you think that's a fair uh, a view that actually you might have every, why would you not, if you're a defendant, why would you not just get the CPS to look at it just on the off chance they discontinue it? Yeah, I, if I can begin. Um, yeah, I 
I, I agree. Uh, the more you publicize um, the ability to do something, the, the, the more uh, the, the greater the take up will be. Um, I, I think my response would be, well, it's there in the legislation. Um, why should defendants be kept in the dark? Uh, you know, why should we expect people to be familiar uh, with the prosecution of offences Act 1985 uh, when they're not lawyers? So uh, I, I, I think putting it colloquially, I, I would say we have to take that one on the chin uh, because it's not a suggestion that we change the law, simply that um, people know what, what that law is. Um, it, in terms of a, a broader um, question that you, you, you started with um, on a slightly more general uh, level, one of the issues which has been raised by several witnesses is to do with disclosure. As far as a private prosecutor is concerned, they're not governed by the Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure, and so they're not uh, bound by the duty to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. It may not be practicable for a private prosecutor to pursue all lines of inquiry, whether reasonable or not. Uh, they might not have the resources to do it, uh, though, as we've heard, some of these private prosecutors are, are extremely wealthy organisations who jolly well do have those resources. Uh, but unless part of the investigation um, is shared with the police, um, they don't have police powers of uh, search and interview under caution and that kind of thing. Uh, and so it may be difficult uh, on a practical level for a private prosecutor to pursue um, lines of inquiry, uh, at least those which point against the suspect. Um, uh, and of course, that's the key to the Attorney General's guidelines when you're investigating, not just looking for evidence which confirms your suspect, but also any evidence which points away from them. Again, I think if, if there were to be um, a code which is of a more binding nature than the um, Private Prosecutors Association code, that can lay down certain requirements, perhaps not as rigorous as the Attorney General's guidelines for the resourcing um, point of view, but it could certainly emphasize the importance of the evidence gathering and not doing it um, in a way which is blinkered. Uh, and I think were, were that to be part of the private prosecution process from the beginning, you know, the, the risk of uh, people being prosecuted um, incorrectly would be reduced at least to some extent. But what about the um, the argument that uh, that the the acting as law officers, the counsel and the prosecution, the solicitor, they have a duty to say, well, actually, did before I move ahead and agree to prosecute this case on behalf of a client, that this that uh, they have to be satisfied that all reasonable lines of inquiry were were um, considered. Certainly, I I would agree that 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 is. Um... An answer, though I, I I would say possibly a partial answer. In that, it depends when the lawyers get involved. Um, in an ideal world, um, the lawyers would be involved uh, right at the outset, um, you know, as as the investigation is starting. Yeah. That, of course, may well not happen. Um, the invested lawyers may well receive fruits of the investigation some considerable time after the investigation has taken place. Uh, and so it is um, you know, certainly possible that um, you know, evidence will no longer be available uh, at, at the time the lawyers get involved and realize it, it should have been um, sought. Um, hence, uh, you know, I, I, th I think my preference for, certainly for those larger organizations who, who, who conduct a lot of private prosecutions, making sure they are aware that from the very outset, they should, in order to achieve uh, you know, a safe conviction and a fair trial, be looking uh, at, at all reasonable lines of inquiry. Okay, any other, any of our other witnesses? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, you know, yeah. In terms of the power of the CPS to take over private prosecutions and either continue or discontinue them, um, there, there seem to be, well, the, the CPS have said they don't have a central database of how many cases are referred to them. So I, I think as matters stand right at the moment, we don't know how often cases do go to them. 
Um, but there was a question that was actually asked in Parliament, I think it was in 2013, about how many cases were referred to the CPS. And it appears back then the CPS did have the, the central data. And if I remember correctly, it was something like 55. Yeah. And, you know, it seems cl pretty clear from just the limited data that we have that there are thousands of private prosecutions each year. So it seems very likely it's a very small number of cases that are referred to the CPS. And I, I think Peter is right that a major reason for that might be people just simply don't know that they can uh, refer a case to the CPS. Um, but you know, without any further study into it, I don't see how we can work out um, why they are not referring cases to the CPS. It just seems clear to me that it's only a small proportion that are referred to the CPS. Okay. And that data would be incredibly easy to generate because I have the template that I would use to do it on paperwork all ready to go. Um, it would cost almost no extra money and it would probably save a lot of money uh, by stopping unmeritorious cases going forward. Okay. Dr. Rogers? Well, well, a point to be made uh, in our written evidence to the committee yeah. uh, is that when the CPS are asked to take over a prosecution, uh, the reviewing lawyer has to fill in a template, which makes, always sounds like a kind of tick boxing exercise. I, I, I've thought about this tick, I've thought about this tick. But presumably these templates are returned to some officials. So the CPS ought to be able to just count up the templates and say we've had X number of cases referred to us over a certain time period. Mm. I mean, it is true that the CPS are not well resourced if lots of defendants do ask them to take over um, prosecutions. Um, apart from saying the usual thing about them needing more resources, uh, I would go in a slightly different direction and say it adds weight to the need for a more rigorous uh, system of inspection. As I say, um, there's only, only the CPS and SFO must be um, yep. inspected, everyone else must invite inspectors in. But that is the most rigorous way to get to um, serial problems in large organisations. Okay, well, well, as we've touched on so many of the other safeguards, perhaps what we haven't discussed is the summons, I think that's right, the, the summons being issued by the magistrate. Uh, to what extent do witnesses feel that acts as an eff effective safeguard, if at all? Well, uh, yeah, Jonathan. I was going to be sceptical. Um, I, I think that magistrates uh, are as under-resourced as, as in every other part of the criminal justice system. Uh, as you know, for many, uh, many years ago, we moved away from committal proceedings where magistrates are expected to scrutinise the quality of the evidence before trial. So uh, although there are a list of things which a magistrate must consider when they're issuing summons, and they're the main things of, is this a proper regular criminal offence? Um, does it sound as if there's possibly enough evidence? But they can't scrutinise it. Um, it it's, it's necessarily a very impressionistic exercise. Uh, whether the prosecution is one that should go ahead would be better decided by the CPS. Then you have their own resource problems. But at least the CPS, if properly resourced, are better suited to do it. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? People are happy with that? Okay. Yeah. I was going to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do you come in? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, yes, I, I agree with that point. But um, uh, Peter referred to Kay earlier, but my, my reading of Kay seems to be slightly different to his, which is that um, it, it's state, to me, it, it was largely reiterating what was already the, the law that the, um, you know, it's, still seems to me large, a large, largely the case that it's a case of just filling out the forms correctly and presenting them to the magistrate. And unless there's like some glaring error, like you've charged, trying to charge someone with an offence that doesn't exist or that um, can't be, you know, that allegedly occurred outside of the jurisdiction. Well, even then there are some um, available on the internet. You can find some uh, paperwork which discloses uh, offences which don't exist in England and Wales, uh, having been rubber stamped by magistrates. Uh, in, fact, in fact, there was a very recent example of that, that um, it wasn't actually a private prosecution, I think it was by the railway police, mm -hmm. to do the COVID-19. Uh, yeah. yeah, we, we've had some evidence around that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously not, um, the, the problems there are not exclusive to private prosecutions. But in terms of whether that acts as kind of a, an effective um, 
sort of filter. I, I, I agree with what Jonathan said that in reality, they're not really um, usually going into the details. Okay, um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll ask the last question in a succinct way. So we've covered, in terms of suggestions for reform going forward, we've covered uh, better monitoring of cases going to CPS, we've covered possibility of inspection regime, we've talked about mandatory disclosure of the ability to refer defendants to the CPS. Are there any other things that we haven't covered that you think we should be uh, considering in terms of reform of this area? Who would like to? Yep, yeah, to, uh, Claire, talk to you. <laughs> um, to save time, I will bullet point it a lot and then say, read our submission, our written submission, and our criminal law review article, where it's bullet pointed in much more detail at the end, uh, as a comprehensive reform plan for all private prosecutions. So firstly, compulsory notification to the CPS on the paperwork every time a private prosecution is initiated. Secondly, a new form of initial hearing as a filtering mechanism with some expertise built in so that nobody has a prosecution going forward for an offence which does not exist in the jurisdiction they were arrested in. Um, and you get rid of potential abuse of private prosecutions sometimes at that stage. Thirdly, we want clear legislative fixing of the CPS duty in relation to private prosecutions. Um, because there's, in our view, too much discretion built in there. They can do what they like, essentially, um, on some of the matters. Fourthly, we want the possibility of exemplary damages to be available for misuse of or malicious private prosecution, so that there is an, an effective deterrent there for um, large organisations who are leveraging their weight and power uh, in an inappropriate way and for a neighbour who hates another neighbour and decides to prosecute them. It does sometimes happen. Uh, we've mentioned the compulsory regulator that we think should exist for large organisations, but that has to go in tandem with a compulsory code for all private prosecutions, which mirrors as far as possible the requirements of criminal evidence and procedure, and um, <clears throat> has sanctions for non-compliance. Okay, thank you. Has there anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I have one further idea in response to that yeah. question, um, besides more resources for the CPS and mandatory yeah. inspection of large organisations. Uh, I think some attention may have to um, be looked at police activities because the police do, as we've already said, sometimes assist private prosecutors in their investigations. And it's entirely up to them whether they do so or not. There's no actual protocol that I can see. Um, if they somehow trust a private prosecutor, they might help him with uh, a searching or a search warrant or an arrest. Um, but the scrutiny seems sometimes missing. As far as I can gather, that there, there were some police officers um, at the scene uh, of some of the post office investigations and what they were doing there, it's unclear, whether they'd actually asked questions about the post office about how they've gathered the evidence, it seems most unlikely that they did. Um, so you can A, wonder whether the B, A, wonder whether the police should be asking more questions when they're asked to assist a private prosecutor. Um, and secondly, another point to make is that the police can actually nip a private prosecution in the bud. Uh, if they're made aware of a potential offence, um, they can actually investigate it themselves and offer the defendant a caution, and that nips any private prosecution in the bud. So the police have sort of powers to, on their own, to nip private prosecutions in the bud by offering cautions, um, and, but they can also help private prosecutors whom perhaps they shouldn't be. Can I just clarify that? So that it, in terms of the, the law, forgive me for my not, not, not understanding that, if you're offered a caution, that if the police dispose of the offence through a caution, that would prohibit a private prosecution on the same charge? Yes, this is, this is an abuse of process um, point. Uh, it, it, it does actually depend on exactly what the police say to the defendant, but in substance, uh, it does nip the thing in the bud. And as okay. you said, they will probably take over and discontinue uh, the defendant's been offered a caution. So either through the PS, it should be discontinued. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, very useful. And um, uh, Paul Barker. Thanks, Chair.
Uh, yeah, I'd just like to ask the witnesses, should the CPS or the Attorney General play a more active role in monitoring private prosecutions? Well, we've, we've talked a good bit about CPS, but what about the Attorney? Um, law officers. Oh. I think my, my, my instinct would, would, would be to, to focus on CPS and uh, the DPP, given that it is uh, the DPP's duty, or the power rather, to take over uh, private prosecutions. And of course, the DPP is line managed by the Attorney General. Uh, and so there is that, that kind of oversight um, in the system anyway. There'd be a particular accountability through the law offices. Okay. Yeah. Any, any other observations, Dr. Rogers? Yeah. Uh, well, when we drafted our submission to you, we were going to make a, write a paragraph detailing how um, small the Attorney General's office actually is. And we deleted it because we were told everyone in Parliament knows how small the Attorney General's office is and no one needs to be told about this. Um, I suspect the Attorney General could be given powers to order um, inspections of private prosecuting bodies or other large prosecuting bodies which come to his attention. but. I have to say, we haven't yet thought through what he should then do with the report when it lands on his desk. And this is something which we are working towards in our project, which will complete next year. Um, and this is a uh, more work to do. Point. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the question as, as to where the money comes from is another question. Uh, should the big organization, which potentially benefits from being inspected, uh, should they be uh, bearing some of the cost of the inspection? There's quite a few questions yet to be answered here. Okay. Paula, the, any other? No, I'm fine. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Any, any, any other members of the committee got any questions for any of our witnesses? No, I think uh, looks, look, 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 looks as if we've covered all, all, all the ground by the look of it. Yeah. Well, look, thank you all, all of you very much uh, to our, our panel of witnesses for your uh, comprehensive answers. Uh, take some of us back a little bit as well, some of, the, <laughs> some of that discussion. So, uh, uh, very helpful to us indeed, uh, and I know we're all grateful to you for your time and your trouble with your written evidence and your oral evidence today. So thank you very much indeed. And there being no other matters to raise, um, the evidence session is concluded. Order, order. <laughs>